الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah um, Tonight's lesson inshallah if we're following along in the book it's the lesson called Faith Through Action Faith through action is the one that we're going to be covering, inshallah, tonight. But before I get into the actual lesson, I would like to give a few spiritual reminders, first of all to myself, but then also to you about the significance of tonight and tomorrow. Tonight and tomorrow are of special spiritual significance. Imam Jawad, alayhi salatu wasalam, says this, Inna fi Rajab, truly, in the month of Rajab, Layla, there is one night, that one night is better for the people than all that that the sun shines on. So tonight is a very special night. Tomorrow is also special. And there are some a'mal, some things that have been recommended. I'd like to mention some of the easier ones. Brothers and sisters, obviously our first and most important duty are our wajibat on those special nights and these special months. But then there are some things that will give us a spiritual boost that will help us to have a better Rajab so then inshallah our Sha'ban is excellent and then inshallah of course the month of Ramadan. Um, so those things because they've been recommended to us they're in Mafatul Janam but some of them that are easier are the following. One of them is Ghusl. We can do a Ghusl tonight. A Ghusl. Um, there are obviously incredible ad'iyah, du'as that we can recite, however amount we wanted to. But then what they say is the greatest of the a'mal tonight, if we want to really take advantage of the night, it's to do ziyara of amirul mu'mineen. So perhaps, brothers and sisters, we can do a quick ziyara of amirul mu'mineen and really benefit, call on him for our needs, our requests. Tomorrow, brothers and sisters, is also, as I mentioned, special. Uh, tomorrow, ghusl is recommended. Perhaps some of us have a wajib fast that's still on our neck. We haven't done qadha yet. We can do our wajib fast on these recommended days. So a wajib fast on recommended days. What is the reward for fasting tomorrow if we have a fast to make up? It's like 70 years of fasting. So this is special if we can do that. If we have just qadha or if we want to have a mustahab fast. Again, ziyara. So this time, ziyara of Rasulullah and Amirul Mu'mineen is recommended. Maybe we can do a brief ziyara of them. Again, those incredible du'as. And the last one is very easy. They say that on this night, tomorrow, one of the things that is recommended is to send many salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So, brothers and sisters, since we're talking about Quranic iman, Faith. And faith is required for salvation. Then obviously, last, the time we talked about it, the first condition for Quranic faith, that was very important. Today's discussion on Quranic Iman is also very important because without it, we're not going to have Iman. And then the next time that we come together, if Allah gives tawfiq, and we talk about the third condition that must be there in order for us to be considered mu'mineen according to Quran is also obviously very, very important. But there's some questions that we'd also like to address as we cover this topic. The questions that we'd like to address are the following. Because, brothers and sisters, we're pushing back against over a thousand years, you may have read this in the book, of misinformation, propaganda, psychological warfare. The enemies of Islam, inshallah, you brothers and sisters, will make it to our next lessons, which are divine promises. When we get to the promises that God, the creator of the universe, has for the mu'mineen, then you and I will see 
why your enemies recognize that if you embrace the faith as is, you are a powerhouse. You will literally flip the world upside down. And these are the ayat of the Quran, promises of God. So they had to fight back. It's not that they would just sit there and watch. They have to fight back. They did propaganda and they got us to come away from these conditions for Quranic faith. But the question that we want to ask ourselves and then answer is, why did the propaganda work? They did propaganda. Why did it work? So that's one question. The second question that we want to ask ourselves is what happens to us both in this world and the next if faith is not action producing? What does it do to us? The leader gives a quick line over there in the beginning of the lesson about that, but we'll try to look at some of the ayat and ahadith that talk about what happens if you have mu'mineen, but for them, iman doesn't produce faith. What happens? So that will be question number two. Number three would be, well, the way that the enemies have defined faith is going to be that what's important is that we have a good heart. Actions aren't critical. Actions aren't critical. We're going to try to find out what's wrong with that definition. So that will be the third question. And then the fourth question are going to be, again, ayat of the Quran, carefully selected that talk about duties that we have as mu'minin and mu'minat, these duties will gradually get more difficult. But they're ayat of the Qur'an. There's no running away from them. We have to make sure that we kind of go over them. Now, brothers and sisters, again, a reminder first to myself and then to you, is that our first and most important and pressing reason for going over these verses of the Qur'an is first of all introspection. Not to point fingers, not what somebody else is not doing. Myself, I want to look at these verses of the Qur'an. The ulama talk about this even if we go to the, if we're in the hawza. And I'm listening and I'm studying because I'm like, as a hawza student, well that's a very good hadith for me to tell everybody else. I, they, the mu'minin mu'min not need to hear this hadith. If that's my niyyah, there's a different spiritual effect than there is to that person who's looking for my responsibility. I personally need to hear the ayat of the Quran, the hadith of the Ahlul Bayt. I need the reminder. So the first one obviously is introspection. The second one though is that we're pushing back against centuries of misinformation. If we want the imam to return, then there's also responsibility that I talked about last time we met, and that was the clarification jihad. So, brothers and sisters, when you finish, so I'm going to do the lesson. I've chosen certain ayat of the Quran to go over, but brothers and sisters, I do encourage you to go over the actual lesson and to get even more examples that the leader is going to give about the same lesson, the same concept, because we also, in addition to introspection, in addition to becoming better, we do have a duty when it comes to the clarification jihad. So that means in other circles, we're also trying to talk to people, people who are good people, but this misinformation is, has still affected the mu'minin and mu'minat. So, if we remember, so we'll start with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, if we remember, then last time we came to the conclusion that in order for us to have Quranic iman, that all types of faith are not accepted by Islam. Islam doesn't accept or embrace every kind of faith that's out there. No. There are three conditions. In order for us to have Quranic iman, then one of the conditions was intellectual conviction. You and I, personally, we have to be convinced that it is Allah, the Lord of the worlds, who's talking to me. And the leader mentioned the other two types of faith, one being tribal, or the other one a faith which was based on taqlid. And that both of them, of course, were unacceptable. We went over the ayat of the Quran. Today's question is this, though. So 
intellectual conviction. You and I personally have to be convinced that Islam is the truth in order to be considered a mu'min according to Quran. Wonderful. Question, is it just book knowledge? Is mental acrobatics enough? Now, brothers and sisters, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, right? Because I like to consider myself young, but I'm old enough to remember sitting in certain lectures where people would keep reproving certain concepts and beliefs about the Ahlul Bayt, reinventing the wheel, reproving basic articles of faith. And the audience would love it when the articles of faith were repeated and proven again and again. But the focus wasn't on some of the other aspects of faith. So let's say I can prove the Walai of Ali bin Abi Talib in 20 different ways. I can prove God exists in 30 ways. Is that enough for me to be considered a mu'min? Is it just book knowledge? Is it intellectual? Conviction, is that enough? So, brothers and sisters, and again, the reason for, and I'm going to kind of do what I normally do, which is means I walk while we do the second part of the lecture, but you and I have to remember that what happens is we're pushing back against misinformation. The way that Islam has been presented to us deliberately by the enemies of Islam has been an Islam that would put us to sleep. The cobwebs are still there in the minds of mu'minin and mu'minat, which is why right now, as an example, because the way that, because in the book it says, this misinformation campaign started after the death of the prophet. But even now, 1400 years later, when we're waiting for the imam to return, there are some Shia, mu'minin, believers, lovers of Ahlul Bayt, but my definition of the Imam, my definition of Islam, is still that of Bani Umayyah. And I'm not even aware of it. I still have the Abbasid definition of who the Ahlul Bayt are, for instance. I really think of the fourth Imam as the Imam, for instance, who was sick. Or, like they told me this personally, somebody will come to you and say, well, look, brother. Why is it that everybody has to be Imam Hussein? Some people can also be Imam Hassan, right? As if one Imam is belligerent and one Imam is diplomatic, right? That means the definition's still wrong. Like, this is a, a lover of Ahlul Bayt. Okay, so you and I, we do have that responsibility to make sure that we do push back so that people have these right understandings. So as I said before, the understanding before and alhamdulillah, it's less now after the revolution, but the understanding before was that the real focus should be on the heart. The heart should be good. The heart, the actions, well, it's good if you have salah, nobody's against that, but is it critical? Is it life-changing? Is everything the action? No. That's the, the, the inside, how you really feel, that's what's important. I heard a story, inshallah, it's not true. They said once, the sheikh, it was the month of Muharram in Iran. So the Sheikh saw that everybody obviously wearing black, they're all dressed in black, but there was one individual who wasn't dressed in black. So the Sheikh said, brother, you know, it's Muharram, black, everybody, ta'lim sha'a'ir, we should be dressed in black. So the guy turned back to the Sheikh, he said, Haja'a, that's not important. He said, Dilit siyah bashe. He said, your heart should be black. Who cares about these outside? That's what's important, right? The actions aren't important. It's the inside. Okay. Now, what happens is, we're going to find out now, what happens if, oh, question. Well, why did it work, though? They did propaganda. They pushed back. They taught us as Muslims, focus on your heart. Nobody can judge. It shouldn't be, right? Why did that propaganda work? There's two reasons, brothers and sisters. One of the reasons that it works is that there is a tendency, there is a tendency to want it to be easy. If we're true to ourselves, I mean, wouldn't it be nice if all you had to do was some tiny action and then paradise was yours? I mean, I would love it. 
if it was just a pie in the sky, a walk in the park, there is a tendency amongst people to want the faith to be easy. So that's one problem that does exist, and why those kind of those who are preaching a faith where it's a, not a challenge, why would that work? The other one, second one, is ignorance. Because sometimes maybe we're not aware of these ayat of the Quran. We're not that this is going against the very same Quran that you're teaching me. Then again, that was another reason that it worked. So now, but what happens though? Next question. What happens if faith is not accompanied with action? Let's say there's somebody who's a very, I have absolute belief that Imam Ali is the first Imam. Absolute belief. I love the Prophet. You don't know the, she the tears that I shed. Right? When it comes to Muharram, I go all out. But it's not a faith that shows itself in my day-to-day -day actions what happens. One of the things that happens is that there's something called cognitive dissonance. What happens is people begin to separate between their actions and what God says. It's hard for me to be honest with myself and say that what I'm doing is a mistake. Allah says this. What I'm doing currently is a mistake and I recognize that and I have to get better. So what happens is sometimes people separate between the two. Sometimes people become hyper defensive, right? I'm so, it's so important to me that I believe that I'm a good person, that that causes me to defend my mistakes. I start off with a mistake, it's going against what God said, but then I can't just accept that, that I'm failing over here. So then I start to justify what I'm doing. Now, what Islam teaches us, and these are now hadith of Ahlul Bayt, being able to recognize, being brave enough to say that what I'm doing currently is a mistake. This isn't right. God said this. I must be like this. This is part of the healing process. So why is it so important that faith be accompanied by actions? Because if it doesn't, the, it's a vicious cycle. The healing process is to be able to honestly recognize what I'm doing is a mistake. God says this, we all have to do this. Hadith now, this is from Imam Baqa. So the Imam says this. So it's part of the healing process. The Imam says this. Wallah, the Imam swears by Allah. Wallah, ma yanju min al-dhamb. No one will be saved or delivered from a sin illa man aqarra bih except for that person who admits that this is a mistake. I have to say that this is a mistake. What I'm doing is incorrect. What God says is this. If that doesn't happen, so the healing process was for me to be able to recognize, not justify. If I'm making a mistake, I say to myself and everyone who else is around me, this is a mistake, there's no justifying it. It was a mistake. I committed a sin, inshallah I'll get better. But I don't justify, I don't, it's okay now. If that doesn't happen, right? So again, because the leader talks about this in the book. In the book, if you remember in the book when you read it, he said that, well, some people say that faith will still remain in my heart. I'm not actively obeying God. I'm disobeying him. I have a favorite sin, but that's okay. My iman is very strong. Nothing's going to happen. And the leader says, if it doesn't show itself in its actions, eventually it can disappear. Ayat now, ayat of Qur'an. So brothers and sisters, if we can turn, let's see if I got this verse of the Qur'an correct. Correct. If you can turn to surah number 30, brothers and sisters. We're going to go over a verse that Sayyidah Zainab recited in the courtyard of the Tawagheet. But it's going to answer a question for us. The question is, what happens if faith is not accompanied by action, if I don't follow Islam's instructions? Okay, so it's Surah 30. Let's see if I got it right, though. Surah 30 and verse number 10. 30, 10. Any brothers, any sisters have it? Some of the brothers, any sisters, you have it? Okay, let me read what I have here, and let's see if I got it right. Ready? It says, Thumma, kana, uh, Do you all see that? Okay. 
So the verse reads this. Thumma kana aqibata alladhina asa'u su'a. Then the end of those who continued to do wrong, misdeeds, right? It, their iman was not accompanied by faith. I continued, I kept pushing. I didn't, like Imam Bakr said, what I'm doing is wrong. I've got to change toba. People make mistakes, toba. If that doesn't happen, if I'm militant, what happens? Thumma kana aqibata alladhina asa'u su'a. And what happens? An kathabu bi ayatillah. If I'm militant, if I won't back down, the end result, the first one we talked about the idea of separating and justifying, but the end result is takdeeb. To say that, no, that ruling is wrong. I can't just keep telling myself, I'm making a mistake, I'm a terrible person. I'll turn it the opposite way. Takdeeb of the ayat of Allah. This is scary stuff. And then what else? It continues. It says, and she read that verse in the courtyard of that monster. They used to mock the signs of Allah. So it started off as takdeeb and denying and no, that's not right. Because right? I have to justify what I'm doing because it's one of two ways. Either I say that what I'm doing is a mistake, then I'll correct it. Or I say, no, I'll just stay here. Or takdeeb. Okay, now the next question. So what's wrong with that definition? Let's say that we say that faith, what's important is my heart. My heart is very good. I love the Ahlul Bayt. I love the Ayat of the Quran. But it's not necessary because there are tens of Ayat of the Quran that say that those who believe all over the Quran. This is a Quranic reality. The two must accompany one another. But let's say um, <clears throat> that I say no. The definition is have a good heart. Have yaqeen that Imam Ali is the first Imam. That's what you need. Yaqeen that Ghadir took place. Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. That's the definition. What's wrong with that definition? So I want to give you a couple of some ayat of the Quran, but first we're going to start off with a story. What's wrong with that definition? If we go by that definition, that all I need is intellectual conviction to be absolutely sure that this is a reality, then that definition is going to include certain people who definitely 100% we say are not mu'mineen, they'll be included. Example, one of the people who you and I, as mu'mineen, again, you'll look for other examples that are mentioned in the book, but we definitely do not believe that Ma'moon was a Shia. We don't say he's one of the Mu'mineen. Ma'moon, Ma'moon is the Taghut who murdered Imam Ridha. When Imam Sadiq talks about him, he's, talking, he's prophesizing what's going to happen to, him, to Imam Ridha wasalam, He says that Yaqtuluhu, that he will be killed by Ifritun Mustakbir. Ifrit, that's what he, how he describes him. But you and I, so we would never say that Ma'moon is a Shia. Okay, now I want you to listen carefully to the words of Ma'moon. Ma'moon was sitting with some of the guys, his inner circle. And Ma'moon said this, do you know who taught me to be Shia? And they were like, you, Ma'moon? They said, no, we don't know. Who taught you to be Shia? He's like, my dad, Harun al-Rashid. And they said, well, Harun al-Rashid? <laughs> he was at war with the Ahlul Bayt, the killer of the Ahlul Bayt. Mahmoud taught you to be Shia? He said, yeah. And he tells a story. I want you to listen carefully to how he became Shia. He says this. He says that we went to Hajj one year. So his father is still alive. Mahmoud is with his father. He said, we go to Hajj. After Hajj, we go Mecca to Medina. When we go to Medina, we set up shop in Medina. Apparently they had some sort of a large tent. I mean, the Khalifa's there. We've just been at Ziyara. He said, my father gave very strict instructions. He told the security, the detail. He said, anybody who comes here to see us, 
First, I want that person to identify themselves and to say their lineage. Are you from Bani Hashim? Are you from Quraysh? Are you Muhajireen? Are you Ansar? I want to know. So Ma'moon said, I was, he's telling the story, he said that what happened was everybody who came, depending on which tribe and how important these things, my father would give anything from 200 dinars to 5,000 dinars. He's giving it up. He said, so this was moving nicely. Alhamdulillah, things were going well. He said, until the security said, there's a man at the door who says his name is Musa ibn Ja'far, and he says his lineage goes back to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So everything changed suddenly. I'm telling the story. Suddenly everything changed. He said, my father told me and my brothers, so we're all princes, right? Ma'moon, I mean, all, we're all, he said to all of us and to the military brass who were with us, the top generals, he was like, everyone mind your manners. Everyone mind your manners. He told the security, he said, allow him to come in, but ensure that he doesn't dismount until he comes over here to where I am. Right, so the chair or the royal carpet or whatever, until there, make sure he doesn't dismount. So the imam came in riding on his steed in the tent. And Mahmoud's watching this. He says, so he came riding, and the imam, when he came inside the tent, he looked, he saw Harun, so he tried to dismount. Harun said, Wallah, please, by Allah, don't dismount until you come. So the imam continued. So Mahmoud's watching all of this. He says, so the imam, he said, the, Mahmoud's describing it. He's not Shia yet. He says, this elderly gentleman, you could see the signs of sujood on his face, wonderful, elderly, venerable man. He comes riding over, and he's riding over on, inside the tent, comes up to where we're sitting. So wherever the, the, the royal fort, the royal rug or, or whatever it is, he says, my father gets up and he walks to go over. Everyone, he says, the general military brass, we all surround this individual, so around this individual, and then after that, he dismounts. He says, my father, Harun, goes over to this man, I don't know who he is, they say his name is Musa ibn Jafar, and he kisses him on the forehead. He tells him, please, you sit where I was sitting. He insists. You sit where I was sitting. And then they begin to have a conversation. I'm listening to the conversation. So he's talking to him. Ya Abul Hassan, dear cousin, how are you? How is the family? How, how are your children? How's the farm? Things going well? Do you have any debts? And the mom's talking to him and he's, he said, cousin, I got you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do right by you. More than that, he said the imam advised my father. He said, he was telling him, he said, when somebody is in charge of ruling the Muslims, they're supposed to take care of the poor and the needy. And he said, my, my father was, yes, Abu al-Hassan, absolutely, 100%. What, I'm going to do just that. He says, this, then this individual got up to leave. When the individual got up to leave, my father also stood up out of respect. And he told us, to, um, by the way, he promised him something. He said that, cousin, I'm going to do right by you. He said, and then he told us, the princes, he said, walk with your cousin. Escort him to his house. So he says that I'm now walking with this individual. He's riding back out, and I'm walking. The prince, Ma'moon, with his brothers, we're escorting this elderly gentleman, and we're going with him to his house. He says, when he got a little farther and nobody else is paying attention, he turned to me. And he said, after your father, you're going to be the caliph. Be good to my children. <clears throat> so Ma'moon says, I came back to my dad, and out of all of the brothers, I was the one who was the boldest. I would talk to my dad. So he said that, um, who is that guy? <laughs> like, the Harun said, these are now the words of Harun. He said, um, Hadha imamun nas. That is the imam of the people. Wa hujjatullah ala khalqih. He is the proof of God over his creation. Wa khalifatuhu ala ibadih. He is the representative of God 
over his servants. So Ma'amun said, I turned to my dad and I was like, but aren't you, you're a mutual mu'minin. You're the, and he said, no, no, that's, that's political. He said, that's for me fighting over power. He said, he continued, he said, wa Musa ibn Ja'far, but Musa ibn Ja'far, Imam haqqin wa Allah. He said, I swear to God, he's the true Imam. He says, inna hu, ya bunayya, so my little son, my young son, inna hu la ahaqqu bi maqami Rasulullah. He is more deserving with the position of Rasulullah, min ni wa min al khalq jami'an. Me, everybody else on the earth, the person who deserves maqam of Rasulullah is Harun Abdul. He said, but you know, this is about power. I got here through force. If it ever crosses your mind, Ma'moon, to fight with me for this chair, he said, that'll be your last thought. Ma'moon continues with his story, still learning how to be Shia. He says that after this, we started to pack up. We're going to leave Medina now. We're going to leave Medina. We're going to go to Mecca. And he said, my father told the security detail, the inner circle. He said that give, uh, he got a black bag. He said, put 200 dinars and give that to Musa ibn Jafar and tell him, tell Musa ibn Jafar, Amirul Mu'mineen apologizes. We're struggling financially a little while, but I'm going to make it up to you. I got you. I'll make it up to you. So then Mahmoud said, and then I told my dad again, I'm like, <laughs> everybody, people you don't even know, you're giving them 5,000, 200, only 200 for him? He said, Harun said, he said that if I did what I promised, then there is no guarantee that tomorrow he won't have 100,000 swordsmen from his Shia and his lovers to fight me. He said, no, son, you listen to me. He said, it's better for you and I that this man and his family, they stay poor. So with us, none of us, we don't consider Ma'moon. He says, well, I'm, yeah, I'm Shia, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I believe it. I believe Musa ibn Jawa is hujjatullah ala khalqih. But we don't say, that's, that, that definition doesn't work. What else is wrong with that definition? If it's just ma'rifah, ayat of the Quran now. We don't believe Iblis is a mu'min, shaitan, okay? Can brothers and sisters, can you follow with me and just see if I got this one right? Let's look to the ayat of the Qur'an now. We're still finding out what's wrong with that definition. Why does Iman have to be accompanied by faith? But if you can turn with me to surah number 7, surah number 7, and verse number 12. Let's see if, we, if I got the verse right. You got some of the brothers? Any of the sisters you have? All right. Let's look at this verse together. I'm going to see if I got it right. Qala ma mana'aka. Do you guys have that? Okay. So who's speaking? God is speaking to Iblis. Allah talking to Shaitan. God said to Iblis, Qal, he said, ma mana'aka alla tashjuda idh amartuk. What stopped you from making sajda when I, God, said prostrate? Iblis responds. Now, brothers and sisters, let's look at the Arabic for this one. Iblis is now talking to God. He says, Ana khayrun min. I am better than he is. What else does he say? This is that marifa, intellectual conviction. Iblis says, Khalaqtani min nar. You, God, you made me from fire. I believe, I have marifa. Khalaqtani min nar. You made him from dirt. So, but Iblis has marifa. But we don't consider Iblis a mu'min. Who else? I don't think we consider Fir'aun a mu'min either. In the time of Musa, we wouldn't consider Fir'aun a mu'min, right? But Fir'aun had intellectual conviction. I have Quran now. Let's see if I got this one right. Brothers and sisters, see if you can turn to verse number 27. So 27, and then after that, see if you can find verse number 17. So we discovered the Iman of Iblis, now let's discover the Iman of Fir'aun, intellectual conviction. Let's see if I got this verse right. So 
Any sisters, if you'll have 2717, any brothers? Okay, good. All right, so let's see if I got this one right. So if you look at the verse later, when you look at the verse, you'll see that Nabi Musa presented those signs of God to Fir'aun. The signs of God. And what happened? Allah's going to tell us that they rejected the signs. But the second part of the verse is very interesting. Let's read the verse together. وَجَحَدُوا بِهَا So Fir'aun and his jama'ah, they rejected those ayat of the Qur'an. They rejected the ayat of Allah that Musa sent, that Musa was bringing, those miracles of Allah. What else though? وَاسْتَيْقَنَتْهَا أَنفُسُهُمْ But their souls, their nafs, their hearts, they had yaqeen. Huh? 27? 14. I got it wrong. Uh-oh. It's my first strike number one. Okay. It's 2714, brothers and sisters. So I made a mistake. Let's see if you can find 20. So Surah 27 and verse number 14. All right. Ready? So let's see if we, uh, let's go back to that verse because I, I said it wrong. Let's see if we can. All right. 2714. They rejected those signs. They had yaqeen. But they had yaqeen. This is God speaking. So the problem with that definition is that it will make a lot of people who we say are definitely not mu'mineen, mu'mineen. Okay. Now we're going to go over our ayat of the Quran, which are going to be telling us. So as I mentioned before, there's tons of ayat that talk about the idea of iman and amal salih That's established. What happens now, we're looking for ayat that talk about iman and then say that as a mu'min, I have certain responsibilities to do mu'min. Okay, so this one, let's see if I got this one right, or if it's strike number two. What happens if I get three strikes? I, uh, I'll be in trouble then. Let's see. Let's see if we can turn to surah number 22 and verses number 77. So it should be surah hajj. Let's see. Let's see if the verse starts out in this way. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu O you who believe Irka'u Do you have that? Yes? No? Maybe so? Yes? Okay. Alright. So obviously let's just read the verse together. O you who believe Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu Do what? Again now God's saying Iman is not just in the heart. I have certain things I want you to do. What does God say? Irka'u Make ruju Make ruku'a what should you do? Make sajda. Wa'abudu rabbakum. Worship your Lord. We're going to learn later that ibadah is not only believing God as a deity and accepting Him as a deity, but obeying Him. Obey your Lord. Waf'alul khayr. And do good. La'allakum tuflihun. That maybe you'll be successful. Right? So what we're seeing over there is that Allah had several responsibilities. It wasn't just in my heart. I have to do Ruku and sujood and worship my Lord. And I also have to do acts of goodness. If I do this, la'allakum tuflihun. Maybe I'll be successful. Right? So again, Allah showed us that that should be there. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go now to another responsibility. So in the book, uh, the leader goes over those ayat. And again, the, our responsibilities. I want to go to another responsibility. So that was one example of some of the social responsibilities that we have as believers. It's not just enough that it's in our heart. We'll go now to another kind of difficult responsibility. In Islam, we can't just be indifferent to other believers struggling with their faith. I can't just see, if I'm a mu'min, can't just see... Um, that someone is not doing something that God said and say, you know, you do you, bro. Whatever floats your boat. Right? Indifferent to another believer struggling. If I do that, then I'm not a mu'min. Brothers and sisters, we're going now to another responsibility that is here in the ayat of the Quran. So this one now, if you can turn, I hope I got this one right. Surah 3, so Ali Imran, Surah 3, 
and verse number 100. Just look at it real quick and just see. Does Surah 3, verse number 100, does it start off talking about those who believe? Does that verse start off? Talk, okay. So it's Allah addressing the mu'mineen. Now we're going to move a little further down to verse number 104. Let's see if I got this one right. God describing one of the duties that we have as believers. God says this, so 104. وَلْتَكُنْ مِنْكُمْ umma. Do you guys see that? Okay. There must be amongst you a group. What do they do? يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ So we're talking about mu'mineen, but mu'mineen have to call, invite, يَدْعُوا إِلَى الْخَيْرِ يَدْعُونَ إِلَى الْخَيْرِ What else? وَيَعْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ and they enjoin what is right. And they stop others if they're doing munkar, if they're doing wrong. These people, these people are the people who are successful. Right? So it's not like that story I heard, inshallah, it's not true. They said once these two guys were out in the woods and then they saw a grizzly bear. And the guys started running for their lives and they ran up to a tree. And then the grizzly bear started to climb the tree. So the, one of the guys reached in his backpack and he took out a pair of sneakers. And the other guy said, but you can't outrun a grizzly. And the guy said, I don't have to outrun the grizzly. I just have to outrun you. The selfish approach to his, I do me, whatever you, no, that's not. The Islamic approach, that's not love. Imam Amir al-Mumin said, Man ahabbaka nahaq. The person who loves you, cares about you. If they see you're making a mistake, they'll speak to you. Okay. Now we're going to get to the verses that I said. So those other verses, later on you'll get a chance to read them. In Surah Hajj, you'll see that the duties got increasingly difficult, but there was a social aspect. Now the kicker. What else does God expect if we're mu'mineen? And brothers and sisters, when we read these verses of the Qur'an, imagine we were there in the time of Rasulullah. What did it mean to be a mu'min? Right? So we can see if we would have had that determination to do what Rasulullah said. Because we know that it's iman and amal. So this one, brothers and sisters, and hopefully I got it right, it should be Surah 8, brothers and sisters. Surah 8, verse number 72. Surah 8, verses number 72. Let's see if I got it right. Does this one, the, the verses you have, does it start off, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا Do you all have that? Okay. Truly those, so, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ Truly those who believe, آمَنُوا This time what? هَاجَرُوا Hijra. Now this would have been challenging. Brothers and sisters, Hijra isn't going from Michigan and flying on a plane and staying for a few days in California and then flying back. No, hijra means everything you ever had, everything you built your life around, your house, your career, your job, your personal relationships. Sometimes a wife would become a Muslim and the husband wouldn't. Sometimes the husband would become a Muslim, sometimes the father Sometimes a son, literally the battles that Quraysh fought, later on you'll hear about them, some of them heard before, where Amir al-Mu'mineen is fighting those who he grew up with. They had nicknames for Ali. If you remember in the battle of, of Uhud, then Talha bin Abi Talha, when Amir al-Mu'mineen came out, he was like, oh, is that you, Qadim? Right, and they said, why did he call him Qadim? Because they used to fight, they used to rock and roll back in the day. Now, so... Hijra meant, I leave everything. The Rasulullah said, move, go to Medina. Dirt poor. Let's read the verses of the Quran. They do jihad with themselves, with their wealth and themselves. Remember, the battle, because Quraysh wasn't just going to let the Muslims go. How many wars did they impose on the Muslims? They did jihad with, the, with their wealth and themselves. Fi sabilillah, in the way of Allah. What else? Another challenge that would have been there. And think about it. How many of us would be able to welcome a complete stranger in our houses? Just for the sake of Allah. Right? Divide your wealth. Right? What else? 
That, the verse, so it's talking about Iman. What else? It says, وَالَّذِينَ awaw, Those who provided shelter. وَنَصَرُوا And they assisted and they helped. أُولَٰئِكَ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ These individuals have that relationship of wilaya that we're talking about. Now, the last part that we're going to get to is the scary part. So what about if I had iman, but I didn't have that commitment to the religion? Verse of the Quran, it says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يُهَاجِرُوا Those who believe, but didn't make hijrah. لَمْ يَكُمْ مِوَلَايَتِهِمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ You have no relationship of wilaya with these individuals حَتَّى يُحَاجِرُوا Until they make hijrah. Then the last verse. The last verse is this. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَهَاجَرُوا Those who believe and do hijrah. وَجَاهَدُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ That's one. And وَالَّذِينَ آوَوْ Those who provided shelter. وَنَصَرُوا And provided assistance. Those people are the real mu'mineen. What if I didn't do that? Fake mu'mineen. So brothers and sisters, this was just, and again, there's so many verses of the Qur'an because you and I, we're looking at the Qur'an big picture. First for ourselves, but then secondly, that clarification, jihad. We end with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.